Hello, everyone. Um, hope everyone's having a good Saturday in their quarantine life. I have to confess, I miss all the students and parents I normally get to see. Um, I've seen a lot of my cats. Um, they're enjoying it a lot. Um, I, uh, pardon me, Elizabeth, could you? Um, I uh, wanna, wanna thank everyone for taking some time out of your Saturday to join us and wanna acknowledge that we um, closed our doors before the governor's uh, request to do so. We wanted to keep everyone safe and sound. Um, we're looking forward to returning to normalcy, but we wanna do so when um, it's wise and proper and prudent. And so we're trying to have a lot of offerings uh, that are online. For years, I've worked with students um, at a distance. I've worked with students I've never met uh, face to face who are at Harvard, or Northwestern Direct Med or Stanford. Um, now I'm working with students who I've known for years, I'm working with them over Zoom. Most of what we've done in the last month has been very well received and very successful. But I wanna talk in general about how we're all gonna make this work um, uh, for college and preparing to apply to college and even those people who've been accepted to college. Um, um, Colleges and high schools were the first to shut down and move things online. Um, I've got some headlines here for you um, that uh, suggest um, that different colleges and different uh, high schools have had different levels of success moving things online. Um, uh, if we, for instance, look at um, private schools like Bishops. Uh, the complaints I've had from students at Bishops are that they only got two days a break and then um, they were uh, back in school. Uh, they were at home, but they were learning over Zoom. Students of mine who are at the Geffen School in Los Angeles had the same complaint. There was too little downtime. The teachers were on it. Uh, I'm a huge fan of Poway Unified and San Diego Union Districts, and I have many teachers and administrators there who I admire, uh, but they were a little slower to get going. It took about two, maybe three weeks before classes were really moved online. And um, for San Diego Unified, as you can see in this headline, um, planning on starting online instruction uh, April 27th. Um, so some are having a lot of success, uh, some are not. Online tends to work very well with small groups and seminar. It tends to work very well in one-on-one -on -one tutoring. It can even deliver the kind of passive lectures in colleges that may not ever really be ideal, but they're no worse off for being streamed online. Uh, the kind of education that most of my students as middle-class public school kids get, 40, 50 kids, 30 kids in a classroom, that's um, tough to deliver. Um, the questions I have right now are, if you haven't had any instruction for two months, or even in some of the really quite excellent public high schools, uh, Tory Pines, uh, I talked to someone yesterday who said um, some of his teachers have been doing a lot of work online and another hasn't done um, anything. Uh, it makes us wonder um, who's learning algebra, uh, who's learning US history. I suppose you can get by um, if you miss two months of US history. Uh, I'm a little biased. I think you probably shouldn't miss it. But um, I'm certain if you miss algebra, um, it'll be very difficult to do chemistry. If you miss um, basic science, it's hard to do more advanced science. Um, I think we're going to have to grapple with some really serious questions about um, um, safety of students, but also uh, the importance of their learning. Um, someone from San Diego Unified suggested that schools might not get back on track uh, until 2022, which um, seems a little extreme and would worry me greatly about um, uh, whether they can deliver learning um, uh, in that environment. Uh, colleges uh, should be more resourced and they should make an easier transition online and many uh, have done so, but most of the students I've spoken with because they're home, uh, we're texting and I'm talking to them on the phone. Most of them have 
suggested that what they're getting online in their colleges is not as robust or as meaningful um, as what they were getting in person. One person literally said, you know, I'm going to get my degree from Yale. It's disappointing not to go to graduation, but um, as long as I get that degree, I don't want to complain. Um, if you were a first year, I'm not so sure you'd be as philosophical about missing a couple months of what is essentially $80,000 of tuition. Um, in fact, it's important to keep in mind when colleges think about how they're gonna handle the COVID-19 crisis, colleges and even high schools are not typical economic entities. They don't have to follow the same rules that we do. In fact, um, many of you are very aware that um, when you apply to a college like Stanford or Harvard, um, you're not really an applicant, you're almost a supplicant. Um, you're doing tricks for them, you're showing them how amazing you are. Um, it's not like other products you purchase, which are expensive, like cars. When you buy a car, no one says, um, uh, we're happy that you're looking at this car, write us a couple essays that let us know if you're the right fit for this car. In a couple months, when we've evaluated all of the applicants, We'll let you know if you can buy the car and then 95 percent of the people discover they're not allowed to buy the car that's stanford and harvard and about 50 or 60 very selective colleges in the united states so it's not surprising that they would send kids home and say we're turning things online deal with it but um, we're starting to see the repercussions of some of those decisions because some colleges are being forced to offer um accommodations to tuition and room and board. And I think that'll affect colleges' decisions about how they deal with COVID-19 um, in, in, in the fall. Um, I think it's um, meaningful that someone shared a letter from Stanford uh, recently, a letter um, um, that would ordinarily be a very happy letter. This is someone who got into Stanford. There's not a lot of those in Southern California. Um, the letter said, we are planning to do classes online. We are not going to discount tuition. Um, basically, uh, you can deal with it, uh, which is not how most of us would be treated um, as consumers of products that are that expensive and that have that much thought put into them. Um, we, um, we're hearing a lot of questions about what colleges and high schools are going to do and I want to try to talk if I can about what what I'm seeing right now and what I think we'll see in the future. Um, I want us to consider, uh, for instance, the um, decision that the UCs and some other colleges have made about um, SAT and ACT uh, requirements and I want to make sure everybody knows almost all of the news stories that I'm seeing are getting this um, fundamentally wrong. Uh, here's an example. Uh, the Los Angeles Times says, UC to ease admission requirements, no SAT grades due to coronavirus. Uh, simply put, that's not exactly right. Um, uh, there is now no requirement to submit an SAT or ACT from the very logical point of view that most counselors want students to take the SAT uh, in high school in the spring of 11th. Um, there are no administrations of the SAT or ACT this spring. It wouldn't be fair for the UCs to say, well, you should have taken the test earlier. You didn't. Uh, now you can't apply to the SAT and ACT because they've traditionally been required. But please keep in mind, the headline suggests they're not gonna use the SAT or ACT in admissions, but that is absolutely not the case. The UCs will certainly be using the SATs and ACTs if students have them. And more to the point, the headline implies, strongly suggests that you get into the UCs by virtue of uh, meeting requirements. And one of the requirements, the SAT has been removed, so now it'll be easier to get in. That's more or less what this headline says, but um, that's not really how admission to any of the colleges that are selective works um, at all. Uh, I'll give you um, some questions that we've received. Uh, over 100 questions, thank you very much. Uh, number 58, 
uh, says, so the UCs won't look at SAT and ACT scores. That is not the case. The UCs absolutely will be looking at the SAT and ACT scores. For the first time ever, they will look at applications if you're not able to take or submit the SAT or ACT. That's what the headline should have said. Number 66 says, um, how will the UCs be looking or accepting at students um, you know, if there's no SAT, ACT, our SAT scores, number 62, not taken into consideration at all. Uh, that is not true. They are absolutely going to be taken into consideration. And I kind of want to show you um, why that's the case. Um, take a moment and look at this, um, at first, confusing array of data points from the fall 2018 admission to UCLA. Uh, in particular, Look at the GPA and uh, total number of applicants for a moment. Um, it's not a requirement that you have above a 4.0 to get into UCLA, but if you look at the data, you can see um, that if you are uh, below a 4.0 uh, by the UC calculation, which I won't go into, it's a little complicated, um, you are 25% likely to be accepted if you're above. That means you're 75% likely not to be accepted to UCLA if you're um, above a 4.0. And if you're a 3.7, 3.8, 3.9, you're about 3% likely to be accepted. Um, it's not a matter of requirements to get into selective colleges. You don't um, get into UCLA um, because you meet the requirements. You could be perfect in scores and grades and still be 75% likely not to get into UCLA. Um, the freshman class of UCLA before, during, and after COVID-19 will be the same. It will be 6,000 students who are entering UCLA as first years. Um, if they ease the requirements, if you can apply without um, submitting SAT scores for the first time due to this emergency, it doesn't mean it'll be easier to get into UCLA. In fact, um, it may mean that more students, um, perhaps not realistically, decide that they'll apply to UCLA because they've been, by a rather misleading headline, told that it's easier to get into UCLA. Um, it could be that instead of 113,000 applications, UCLA has 125 or 130,000. And that is not going to mean that it is easier to get into UCLA. In fact, if the requirements have been relaxed, um, you'll probably get more people applying. And that's something we, we find intimidating. That's something you want to keep in mind. Um, people don't get into UCs or Ivy Leagues by meeting requirements. You get your driver's license or you get into Wyoming State by meeting requirements. Um, I had someone this year, a marvelous student who was accepted to Harvard and Yale uh, and Berkeley Eeks and he was rejected by UCLA. Someone suggested this week that UCLA must have known that he would never come to UCLA and that was why they didn't accept him. Um, UCLA doesn't know whether you got into Harvard or Yale and this student is probably gonna go to Berkeley. He might have considered very carefully UCLA. He didn't get into UCLA, not because there was something wrong with him and he didn't get into UCLA because they didn't think he would come. He didn't get into UCLA because 53,000 other kids applied who in many ways looked just as strong and just as ambitious. And there's an arbitrary element to college admissions um, that will probably be exacerbated in light of the COVID-19 crisis we're in the midst of. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about high school grades in the time of COVID-19. Um, the SATs are largely regarded along with the ACT as an objective measure. Um, this is um, as close as we get to an objective measure. But the second somewhat objective measure, less objective, more subjective, where you go to high school really does affect how hard it is to earn a good GPA. Um, 
but still a cognitive, relatively objective factor would be grades. Um, some schools, some high schools are giving traditional grades. They are mostly private schools that went online quickly. Those schools are going to be giving A's to students who do very well, B's, C's to students who do less well. Many other schools are doing pass fail and other schools are giving no grades or giving everyone A's. So a reasonable question to ask um, would be if uh, both of the cognitive factors uh, grades and scores are now volatile. If um, some kids are being held to a very high standard um, uh, where they have to do very, very well to get A's and other students get automatic A's, um, a reasonable question would be um, how are colleges, IVs, UCs, selective colleges going to uh, make admissions decisions? In fact, someone asked a question, question number 42. Um, basically, how will colleges know who to admit without SAT scores and only partial grades? Now, there's something flawed in the core of this question. They will have SAT scores. They're just not going to require them, but they will have partial grades. And one answer to this question is holistic admission. Um, holistic admission has a history going back to basically the 1960s in American colleges. Um, Ivy's first introduced holistic admission. Um, it's, a, it's a story told in these two books, um, The Chosen by the extraordinary sociology professor Jerome Carabell and Nicholas Lemon's marvelous book, The Big Test. It's a history of the SAT. Holistic admission came about in the Ivies, frankly, because there were too many uh, immigrants who had good SAT scores and good grades, and the Ivy Leagues didn't want that many immigrants. And in the 1960s, when you say immigrant, back then it meant too many kids who were Jewish. Um, I'm not going to go into today's admissions landscape, the politics are fraught with uh, pitfalls, but let's just say that I know quite a few students who are immigrants, who have great grades and great scores, and if that got you into Ivy League or UCs, um, this would be a very simple project. But in fact, holistic admission has become the trend across almost all selective colleges. Holistic admission, as the name suggests, is meant to look at the whole person, cognitive, and non-cognitive factors. So an important question this year and maybe going forward is going to be um, if the SAT and ACT um, is not an absolute requirement, although I expect the vast majority of people applying to uh, most colleges even this next year will submit SAT and ACT scores. If grades are not uh, a reliable factor right now. Then uh, viewer question number 19, what do the UCs look for in applicants? That's a pretty good question because traditionally, I would show some statistics like those I just shared with you. Uh, if you wanna go to UCLA, you better have good grades. There are other statistics buried further in that I didn't share with you. You can see how many APs you probably should be taking to have a reasonable chance of getting into a school like UCLA. You can see that um, you have a chance getting into Berkeley and UCLA uh, without great SAT or ACT scores, but you can see how much of a chance. It drops off in tiers uh, pretty steeply, depending on um, your objective cognitive factors. But as many of my students, as my clients, my families know, um, even this year, uh, and almost every year, I've had students get into Berkeley who were um, lower in some of those numbers. That's because Berkeley, like Harvard, is holistic in its admissions approach. They will look at many factors. If you have a learning disability, if you've had a family challenge, um, Berkeley will take that into consideration. Uh, so one answer to how will admissions look in light of COVID-19 is, it will be more holistic. But we want to keep in mind, holistic is supposed to mean 
the whole package, the whole piece, scores and grades and cognitive factors, and then non-cognitive factors, your leadership, your life experience, um, that spark that I want my students to have. Um, it's very unlikely that colleges will completely cut off the cognitive factors, even though headlines somehow suggest those aren't going to be required. I'm pretty sure that most universities would like to know, um, can you read something that's challenging and difficult? Um, are your grammar skills where they should be? Can you do algebra? And I'm worried that if kids over two or three months are not learning algebra, uh, for some kids, um, the answer may be no. Uh, and so I want to make sure kids are taking advantage of this time if they have the ability to do so. And I applaud teachers who are really on it and using Zoom and online options to great um, effect. Um, I want to talk a little bit about how you will market yourself uh, to colleges in the time of COVID-19. Um, um, you are certainly going to want to talk about what you've done and all of the activities that you're involved in, and you will absolutely want to talk about hardships or difficulties. But um, one of my concerns is that um, some college admissions people um, uh, may emphasize very heavily uh, hardships and difficulties. And I don't think that's wrong. I think that makes sense. But many of my students are middle class. Um, their parents had significant hardships and difficulties and overcame a great deal. And they tried uh, their very best to make sure that their children um, have a safe, comfortable, uh, nurturing environment. Um, there's a part of me that considers it not quite fair that students might be punished for not having a sad uh, tale to share. I'm not sure that that should be a requirement to get into college if we're thinking about requirements. Um, and a very important and tough question to answer is, okay, what should my student be doing then to uh, improve these non-cognitive factors, activities and extracurriculars, because of course, many summer opportunities have been canceled. Now, some, it's a wait and see. It may well be that flattening the curve has been effective and people will be able to, using some common sense and um, common safeguards, participate in summer activities but I would say many students are looking for things they can do online that might have been less attractive options before. And um, many students we work with, um, I met them in the ninth grade or 10th grade. And so for a year or two, they've been thinking about how they want to present themselves to colleges to show the UCs and IVs that spark those interests, those passions. And um, those students are probably not uh, poorly positioned for the current moment. Um, if you haven't thought about how you're going to market yourself in a holistic admissions environment, um, it's probably a good time to start thinking about it. Um, um, we have a question um, that is, um, what are we going to be doing for SAT and ACT testing this summer? Um, I um, have thought about this a great deal, and the uh, um, uh, answer is twofold. Um, we are preparing for the possibility that we'll do in person classes, and we've made arrangements to conduct them in our offices in Forest Ranch and in Carmel Valley. But we've also made preparations to assume that we would do um, uh, we would do classes online. Um, We've learned a lot over the years about working online, and so we've adjusted our summer program to be more seminar style, to have smaller classes and a lot more interaction. And um, with great, um, after great consideration and thought, um, I've made the decision that for all of our summer students, if we are in fact doing online work, uh, I'm going to give them uh, if they're in the intensive,
classes, $1,000 of free tutoring, one-on-one -on -one online tutoring. Uh, and if they're in boot camp or 1636 goal, I'm going to uh, simply give away um, $2,000 worth of online tutoring. Um, I think what we do online um, is very strong and what we will do this summer is strong, but I want to make sure parents know that as a hedge um, for students who don't connect online in our classes, uh, we're adding significant one-on-one -on -one instruction. Um, it's something that we haven't done in the past, but this is like nothing we've seen before. And I would, um, I guess, humbly suggest that um, if you're paying $80,000 for Stanford, they may suggest, um, they may consider something similar because um, one of my deep concerns is that um, we all wanna be safe, but student learning is important. It'll have consequences to lose several months of education. Um, I don't think we would tolerate someone in med school missing two or three months of the curriculum. I'm not sure I'd want that person as my doctor. In flight school, if you learned 60% um, of the curriculum, but you didn't learn how to land the plane or how to fly in rough weather, that would be difficult. Um, we kind of assume that um, learning matters um, a great deal. Um, I uh, wanna, um, before I go on and talk a little bit more about summer programs, I wanna remind people that in a world of narrative admissions, um, there are going to be, um, there's gonna be much more importance on your college essays. And the work that we do at Hamilton um, is influenced by that and has been for a long time. And so um, I don't wanna brag about it, but in many ways we are, um, because we're moving into a narrative driven um, admissions process. Um, I think that our position as experts in narrative um, um, can be and um, has been and will be helpful for our students. I taught 18th and 19th century British literature at UCLA and uh, some of my advanced um, PhD exams were narrative theory. Um, the people who work with me, who I've for years had as full-time salaried people, um, one has a master's in rhetoric, another a PhD in history, another is a Columbia English major who has a master's in college counseling. Um, uh, we, we know that narrative and storytelling are gonna be very important in the context of COVID-19 admissions. And um, again, I don't wanna be unseemly, but last year, 81% of our students we worked with for college got into Berkeley. Um, Berkeley's admissions rates, depending upon major, are more like five to 15%. So, um, we're good at finding a story uh, that's a true story and that is your story. Because if colleges will miss the SAT and ACT, miss grades from some students, you better believe they're gonna be focused on stories. Um, this year, I'm proud to share 25%, uh, more than 25% of the students in this part of Southern California, the counties that are in the South, who were accepted to Harvard were Hamilton education students. I'm very happy for them. Um, none of them got in because of athletics or donor status or legacy status. Uh, they all got in largely because of their stories. Because I promise you, the grades and scores, they were good, but they weren't better than people who didn't get in. It was a very story-driven process. Um, what you do this summer um, is um, limited. Uh, you're not gonna be able to travel the world most likely. You're probably not gonna be able to create or build or even attend some of the programs, but you would wanna look for 
online options that tell a story. Um, I wanna um, give you just a little bit, um, I don't know if I'd say advice, maybe just some observations I've seen over the years in terms of um, uh, strategies and tips in times of crisis. In 2008 and 2009 and 2010, I saw some things happening in college admissions that are probably worth um, thinking about. Um, in 2008, 2009, I had families who were certain they wanted their daughter to go to MIT, and we worked very hard to make that a possibility. And in one instance, this young woman got an acceptance to MIT, but the family lost a considerable, um, a considerable chunk of their savings in the Great Recession. Uh, there was unfortunately divorce and further expenses, and she ended up uh, choosing to go to Berkeley uh, and was very happy there, very successful but she made a spot for someone who was on the waiting list at MIT. Um, that's going to happen this year, uh, very, very likely. We're gonna see more volatility and more um, uh, movement on waiting lists. The UCs, I don't have a crystal ball, but I will predict the UCs, which have always had waiting lists that have a lot of movement. In some years, everyone on the waiting list for certain UCs has been accepted. In other years, more like 50%. Your chances are typically pretty good if you're on a UC waiting list. I'm gonna not go out on a limb, but predict that um, as the economic turmoil created by COVID-19 unfolds, we're probably gonna see that the UC waiting lists will be um, seeing two counterbalancing forces. We'll see um, students choosing to go to the UCs because they're in state and they're less expensive options, very attractive, less expensive options. But we'll also see fewer students from out of state committing to the UCs because for them, for 49 other states, they are more expensive options that were attractive because of the weather and the reputation of the UCs, the beauty of their city. So I think we'll probably see what in Vegas we call a push about even um, forces in waiting lists, but for private schools, I think we're gonna see a lot of volatility in the waiting lists. Um, for, for many students, I think we're gonna see colleges using merit awards in the next year or two very aggressively to try to recruit the best students because some colleges have a billion dollars in the bank and you wanna consider the way you get merit awards from these colleges um, are first and foremost, uh, your scores, your objective scores uh, on the PSAT, the National Merit Finalist Award, uh, semi-finalist in fact, is one of the key indicators for many colleges in terms of determining merit scholarships. USC, if you're accepted, will automatically cut your tuition in half if you're a National Merit semi-finalist. I admit it's a pretty high bar to get over um, 40,000 juniors last year um, took the PSAT and um, 212 were National Merit semifinalists. Um, 112 were Hamilton education students. And so I met with someone yesterday. We went through the merit offerings. Now you can't attend all the colleges that offer you money, but her merit awards added up to 575 uh, $1,000. Um, in these financially uncertain times, uh, merit awards are going to be a pretty powerful factor uh, to recruit students, and they might be a powerful factor in students' ability to attend colleges. Um, colleges that are very rich will still have money and still be rich. Um, I would predict, based on past years, that the UCs will probably have funding issues uh, based on uh, the effect of this crisis on the tax base. And I, um, I taught at UCLA during some of those years in the 90s. Uh, it will affect class sizes and your access to resources. I'm still a huge fan of the UCs, but you might want to consider if a private school that's in not such an exotic city offers you $180,000 to attend uh, and your dream is to go to med school, 
you may find a school where 30 people are in organic chemistry and they're paying you to go and there's a named scholarship that will be on your curriculum vitae uh, forever, you may find that is um, a very, very tempting uh, offer. Um, again, I'm not wanting to make predictions necessarily, but I think it's likely that for many people whose dreams came true this year and they can attend an Ivy League school, they can attend a school like Stanford, uh, they can attend top liberal arts college. Um, if classes are going to be online, um, you may want to ask if a gap year might not be an option to consider. Um, I would try to ask some careful questions. How are they going to deliver instruction online? Are they going to change the format of learning and instruction to make it work online? If so, it, it may be a good experience. If they're going to do what some colleges and many high schools have done and pretend that you just put a camera in front of a classroom and it's the same experience, I'd be skeptical of whether that experience is um, worth the uh, is worth the you know, high, high tuition they're charging. Um, I have questions that I've been, um, that I've had delivered to me that people have asked and um, many of them, as I've already said, um, seem to be inspired by headlines that suggest that the SAT and ACT are somehow not going to be used this year. So I wanna say, Again, that is not remotely what the UCs or any college has said, that they won't be used, but that they'll still read your application if it was impossible for you to take them. So um, I'm gonna look at some questions and try to um, do my best to answer them. Um, will this trend of going test optional help or hurt kids who took the test early and got a good score? There's no context in which having a good score on an SAT or ACT will hurt a student. There's in fact no context in which it won't help them. Um, colleges themselves are ranked and scored. Here's the most popular, the US News. Take a guess how US News makes these rankings. One of the factors, an important one is the average SAT or ACT scores of the students who are accepted. Although colleges like encouraging students to consider the SAT or ACT as optional, I want you to consider at the many conferences and conversations I've engaged in over the years, there are many people who point out, again, I don't wanna pick on UC Chicago, but UC Chicago, when they went test optional at a conference, another admissions person sitting next to me said, I'll tell you why UC Chicago went test optional. They want more uh, applicants who don't have any business really applying to UC Chicago and they'll get more rejections which means more selectivity and they'll go up in the ranking and indeed um, University of Chicago on this ranking is above Yale um, very clever marketing in general though uh, very unlikely any of these colleges will not pay careful attention to the SAT or ACT because the average scores contribute to their ranking. So much so that a very good school on this list had a dean who fudged the numbers just a little to US News. He added nine points to their average SAT score of admitted students. And when US News found out, they removed them from this list and he was fired. So I'm pretty confident that I can answer this question um, uh, about, you know, whether kids who took the test already and have good scores, whether they'll be harmed, they will not be harmed. They are, um, they're like people who sold their stocks about three months ago. They're going to look pretty smart. Um, here's a question. Will selective colleges try to adjust their ACT or SAT, or SAT range because of COVID-19? Um, no, I don't think they will because they want to report to US News um, that their students are objectively 
uh, very talented and uh, very strong performing on these objective measures. Um, let's see. Um, here's a really good one. Some schools explicitly said lack of SAT will not hurt admissions chances. Should we still try to take the test and submit? Um, I would say you should take the test and submit it because again, some schools have told students the SAT is optional. And when you really look at how they make decisions, um, the SAT and ACT are unlikely to ever be truly optional for middle-class students who go to good schools and have the advantages of two employed parents and excellent teachers um, in their school district. When colleges tell you that certain things are optional, you need to understand these are colleges that are trying to open the doors for good and sometimes not so good reasons to get uh, students who might otherwise be intimidated and wouldn't apply. Um, those are not typically students at CCA or Westview or Del Norte or Bishops. Um, let me see if I have one more question. Um, is there going to be SAT prep during the summer? And if yes, what will the format be considering COVID concerns? Again, uh, the format is if we're allowed, if it's deemed safe, we'll have in-person classes. I miss teaching. It's natural Prozac. I love it. If we can't do that, um, we've already built out um, extensive programs that change the format of our classes to be smaller, more seminar style, and simply give everyone one-on-one -on -one tutoring because I'm pretty certain um, colleges and high schools, some of them who are forward thinking can make this work, but I'm absolutely certain that one-on-one -on -one tutoring is very effective over Zoom and Skype because we've been doing it for years. In fact, some of our perfect scores out of 162 perfect scores, some of them are one-on-one -on -one tutoring conducted in that way. Um, I want to see if there's a final question. Um, do you think colleges will decrease tuition if fall classes are online? Um, I know that Stanford doesn't plan to. Um, we'll have to see what colleges will do. Um, you may ask them, would you consider giving more small group uh, more one-on-one -on -one work in your college. Um, that's what we've chosen to do. And um, I do look forward to seeing students uh, this summer, whether it's in person or um, online. Um, I know I'm gonna be busy either way, just um, um, depends on whether I'll be staring into a screen or whether I'll be um, stomping around a classroom. I want to encourage people to submit further questions. Uh, we'll do our very best. Um, this recording will be posted online, I'm told. Um, uh, maybe um, you've noticed my hair is grayer and longer. Uh, I think uh, for many of us um, in my age bracket, that's what this quarantine has done. Um, I want to um, thank Maella and Brandon and everyone who's helped us um, with our online transition and um, thank our students and families who've reached out to us and congratulate um, our students this year. It was, um, I mean, there's always excitement and heartache uh, in mixtures in college admissions, but um, from the point of view of some of the most desirable colleges, it was, um, it was a really good year this year. And um, I want to congratulate everyone whose college dreams seem um, to have come true and encourage everyone to um, keep working um, toward those goals. We don't know exactly what the next couple months will hold, but I am certain um, UCLA will not have more people in their freshman class. Harvard will not have more people in their freshman class. They will simply need to look at additional pieces of information to decide who those people will be. Um, and if you want, I can try to reach out and see if some of the students who are there could share some of their insights about the path that they took. Um, everyone stay safe 
and uh, try to make the most of this, I would say uh, read a book. Uh, we actually have a book list on our website. Thank you, everyone.